Hello, everyone. I'm Dr. Marty Ross, and this is another Conversations with Marty Ross, MD. Um, this is our uh, Lyme Q&A webinar session about um, Lyme disease. Uh, no two webinars are the same in my series, and you create them with your questions. And so uh, it's up to you uh, to figure out the direction of how this goes. The way that you write questions to me is there's a chat box on the right-hand side of your screen. Um, go ahead and write your questions there. I ask that you do not hit the enter button until you're done writing your question, because if you do, it creates multiple questions on my side, uh, which gets a little bit difficult to manage. Uh, during the webinar tonight, I'm going to post your questions on the screen. So those of you that are watching this live actually get to see copies of the questions as I read them. Um, for those of you that are listening in on any recordings, whether it's a, um, uh, an, um, a podcast or whether it is a Google uh, or YouTube recording, that is, um, you'll see that uh, you don't get to see those questions. So I'll be reading those so you can actually hear them. Uh, I am creating a recording of tonight's webinar, and tomorrow morning I will send you an email letting you know when that recording is available and with a link of how you find that recording. Uh, tonight I will also be showing you um, screen shares of the Treatline book, uh, which is the website that we have where I have all of my writings and uh, um, is available uh, for you to see later. Uh, but I'll show you where you can read more about some of the information that we talk about tonight. Or if I'm not able to completely answer your question, I'll show you with the articles there that you can take a look at. Um, regarding the Treat Lyme book, I have just uh, rebranded and recreated the whole Treat Lyme and Associated Diseases site. It is now called the Treat Lyme book. I'm using a different platform, which brings the articles more up front so you can see them easier. Um, and so uh, well, I'll be showing you that tonight. Um, I would ask that if you have a chance to look at our information, if you would, and if you'd subscribe, uh, when you subscribe, it gives me more time to write more helpful articles, and there's a lot more I can write. Uh, it's just difficult to find the time when I'm also running a busy practice here, but I would make more time if I have uh, more financial support to run the treat line book. So I would hope that you actually find the useful, the information useful tonight, and that you would take the time to subscribe to the treat line book. Uh, to support the work that I'm doing here to reach out and help as many people as possible. In other words, you can be part of the help and the solution for people with this illness as well, too. So I'm glad to see uh, many familiar faces here and also new people. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. Um, I'm going to go ahead and take the first question here. Let's see. Hello, Jackie. And I see, Jackie, that you have a long question, so it's in three parts. And so I will be uh, posting each of those three parts tonight, everyone, as I read Jackie's question. Um, hi, Dr. Marty and Pups. Uh, that's right. Jackie's pointing out that I have two Basinjis that are in the house with me here tonight. You may see them hop around in the back uh, periodically, although they are, looks like they're asleep right now. So <laughs> we may we may not be um, interrupted by the Basinjis tonight. But um, so that's who Jackie's referring to. Uh, very occasionally uh, over the past few years, as Lyme progressed, I feel I might faint. I become weak, lightheaded, and have been told that my eyes start to go. I have managed not to faint, though it has been very close. Lately, if I look at a computer screen and someone else scrolls, let's see. Um, I feel car sick. Last week on a long drive, my friend showed me her phone and scrolled. Later, I began feeling faint. This time was much worse. Short breaths were calming, but I was not getting enough oxygen. Deep breaths and helped, but I was too weak to take them. My hearing started to go. The trouble, breathing was uh, physically uncomfortable. I was afraid what would happen to me if I lose consciousness. Unsure if this is Babs or Bart, could you advise me if this happens again? Anything I can use uh, to breathe in to keep me awake? It was scary to lose control and not know what will happen. Thank you. All right. Let me just look. I want to look back at the beginning part of your question again here. Just a minute. So, Jackie, um, it's difficult for me to say if the feeling faint and feeling like you can't get enough air from time to time is Babesia or not. Yes, um, having air hunger, a feeling like you cannot breathe is a symptom of Babesia. But there are other symptoms of Babesia too. And so those symptoms, and you can find that uh, the symptom checklist 
in my article in the treat line book called kills bad bees or how to diagnose bad bees is actually what it's called. Um, there's a video that goes along with that too, but symptoms to think about Babesia are um, having panic attacks, having drenching night sweats primarily. Um, sometimes they'll spill into the daytime, but usually nighttime. Um, those are the two hallmark symptoms. Usually people will have panic or they're going to have drenching night sweats. But other symptoms that make one think of Babesia uh, can be air hunger, uh, uh, can also be having racing or skipping of your heart, uh, somewhat regularly those would occur. Another symptom can be having headaches in the front of your head, um, sometimes also associated with migraine headaches as well too. Uh, and some people with uh, Babesia have a strange symptom, I think it's strange, I think it's one of the more interesting symptoms, and that is that they'll have um, uh, repeat deja vu experiences. So those are symptoms that make you think of Babesia. Also Babesia in some people gives a rash that looks like little red blood blisters underneath the skin. Okay, so I don't, in the way that these forums work, I don't get to ask you enough other questions to know if this is Babesia or not. What I would say is maybe, but this getting lightheaded easily also can be a symptom of adrenal fatigue. Um, so your adrenal glands uh, are a hormone system that sit on top of your kidneys and they release cortisol. They also release another um, uh, chemical called mineral corticoids. And mineral corticoids uh, tell your kidneys to keep sodium in the blood vessels, uh, sodium salt in the blood vessels. And why that's important and how that fits in with fainting is wherever sodium is in the body, water is attracted there. So if you have a lot more sodium kept in your blood vessels, that brings more water into the blood vessels, which expands your blood volume, all right? And with expanded blood volume, there's a greater chance you have enough blood to go up to your head, especially when you stand up, for instance, okay, to find gravity. So if you're not having adequate uh, um, uh, mineral corticoid production by your adrenal glands, if you have adrenal fatigue, adrenals being pooped out that can happen in Lyme disease, you may just have lower blood volume because you're not holding enough sodium in. So that was one thing to think about. Okay, so symptoms that make one think of low adrenals are um, getting lightheaded easily and standing up or having periodic dizziness. Um, another symptom could be having a periods of low blood sugar, which is hypoglycemia. So if you get jittery or shaky easily and that gets relieved by eating, that's hypoglycemia. Finally, another symptom of low adrenals is getting afternoon crashing, okay? So this could be part of low adrenals. I'm just throwing you out some ideas that you might want to consider. Then finally, another thing that can lead to fainting is having dysfunction of your uh, anti-adrenaline adrenaline systems, or we call that the sympathetic, parasympathetic nervous systems. There's a nerve that regulates your adrenaline, anti-adrenaline, and that's called the vagal nerve. It's one of what is called the cranial nerves, and we have 12 of them. These are nerves that start at the base of your neck, right at the bottom of the skull, and they regulate certain things. The vagal nerve regulates our blood pressure. It regulates our digestion. It regulates how our heart works as well, too. And that can become infected by Lyme and can give you fainting episodes. Babesia also can give you those fainting episodes as well, too. So there's a lot of things to consider here. I can't, I don't know for sure what's causing your problem. I would need to do more of a direct questioning with you to help figure that out. But if you happen to have enough of the symptoms of low adrenals, like I was just describing, one solution is to start taking a teaspoon of salt a day. And if this is happening while you're driving, stop. Um, and then you may want to actually literally um, lay down so that you're getting enough blood flow to your head, all right? If you put your head at the same level as your heart, there's a greater chance you're gonna have adequate blood flow to the, to the head. So that would be a quick solution for that too. But unfortunately, Jackie, I don't have enough question. I would need to do more of a give and take, a question and answer with you to help tease this out more directly. But those are some things for you to think about, okay? All right, now you can find some information about low adrenals in the treat line book in the hormone, in the hormone chapter. You can find information about how to diagnose Babesia in the How to Diagnose chapter. Um, and um, yeah, I think that would give you some information. So I just want to show you how we would do that, okay? So I'm going to do a quick screen share here. Now I know last week our screen shares weren't working, but this week it looks like it is from what I can tell from my side. Um, so let me go ahead and share. All right, so we are, that, that shared a little bit weird. Let me go here. 
There we are. All right, so I, this is the treat line book, all right? This is the landing page on the treat line book. And up here in the chapters tab, this big mega menu pops out, all right? So if you wanna find information about how to diagnose Babesia, we're gonna to go to the how, how to diagnose chapter here. And this pulls up all the articles I've written about how to diagnose different things in Lyme disease, of which one of them is the article on how to diagnose Babesia, all right? This is one of the articles that you have to be subscribed to, but it lays out uh, in some detail the things that I consider, okay? And then in terms of hormones, the chapter that we have on hormones, let's see, where is it here? Somewhere here, unless, unless I didn't put it in this list, where did it go? Well, how do you like, oh, there it is. Okay, there's the hormones. And this is our chapter on hormones. And in terms of, so here's the article that you would click on to read more about adrenals. And my favorite herbal support that I like to use for the adrenals is ashwagandha. And you might want to consider that one too. All right. So let me go back here. Actually, let me stop sharing first. All right, let me go back. All right, so here we are back again, and I hope the screen share worked tonight. I'm gonna to scroll to see if anyone has said that it's not working. I don't have any responses for anyone saying the screen share didn't work, so I, I think it did work tonight. This is good. All right, so let me go ahead and move on here. Jackie, thank you for that question. Um, the other thing, Jackie, if you wanna consider more of a direct input from me, I do run something called an online consult service, or I call it a one-to-one -one medical consult service um, through the treatline.net site, the treatline book. Uh, you can see there's links uh, that you can click to set up a online visit with me and I'd be glad to consider uh, your specific situation and anyone you can do that, okay? So one of the times when we go back to the treatline book tonight, I will show you where you can go to set up one of those online consults. And I do have space uh, to do those kinds of visits with people to give you my insights uh, of things that you might wanna change in your treatment um, and even things you might want to discuss with your physician, for instance, if you have a physician involved too. Okay. All right. Thank you for that question. Uh, let me go ahead and move on here. Let's see. Suzanne, hi. Let's see. You've, let me, you've got one part of your question. It just says hello. And I think there's a second part here. Let's see. There we are. Hello. I recently was prescribed um, Ceprazil, uh, 500 milligrams twice daily with doxycycline twice daily. Is this sufficient enough with grapefruit seed extract to treat Lyme for a year? So um, it is sufficient to, to treat Lyme. Now for a year, I'm suspecting these drugs will stop working before a year is over, okay? So let's look at what you're taking. So Cef, uh, is a Cef, uh, is in a family called the Cephalosporins. Other members of that family are Cefuroxime, also called Ceftin. Um, there's something called Ceftinir. Um, um, and th those would be the common ones that we might use. And then there's the IV antibiotic called ceftriaxone that many of you that use IV antibiotics would be aware of that one, okay? Those are all cephalosporins. What cephalosporins do is they treat only one form of the Lyme germ, and that is the spirochete form, okay? That's the corkscrew looking thing that many of you have seen online before, okay? Now Lyme doesn't exist in just the spirochete. It actually exists in two other forms. One is a form of the germ that lives inside of your cells called intracellular Lyme. And then there's a third form of the germ, which is a microscopic cyst form of the germ. All right, so to get over Lyme, you have to treat all three forms. The, uh, the cephalosporins, in this case, your, uh, your cephrazil, only treat the spirochete. And they do so by effectively resulting in holes developing in the covering of the germ. Because what happens is the covering of the germ gets injured and it has to repair the holes. Cephrazil and uh, the cephalosporins and uh, penicillins actually block the ability for the germ covering to repair itself so it develops holes and it grows and it bursts basically all right so that's treating spirochete your doxycycline is treating intracellular line and it also treats spirochete but it does from the inside because what uh, doxycycline does is it limits protein production of the germ so the germ basically withers and dies it can't grow so it withers and dies all right and then finally, grapefruit seed extract is a great herb that treats the microscopic cyst form of the germ. It works about, it's about 80 to 90% as potent as a prescription we can use. And the prescription would be something called Flagyl or a brother sister of Flagyl called uh, Tinidazole. Flagyl is also called Metronidazole, all right? So it, this is a treatment that treats all three forms of the germ and that's what you want to do. 
Now, you don't even need the, Sep the Seprazil to do that. You could just use your doxycycline and the grapefruit seed extract, and that would be a full treatment too. You may get a little added advantage in putting the Seprazil in, but you don't necessarily need that, okay? Now, what my issue is with your treatment is I usually will change the antibiotics that I use for somebody about every six months, even if it's working. And the reason I do that is there is the concern I have that over time of using the same antibiotic again and again, what you're gonna wind up getting drug resistance, all right? Where the Lyme germ is gonna learn resistance to that antibiotic and so it stops working, all right? So usually as a rule of thumb, I'm gonna change my antibiotic protocols about every six months, okay? Now, if you wanna see how to build a Lyme treatment, um, how, I, how I just described that, I have written in some detail in um, the Treat Lyme book. And I'm gonna go ahead and do a share here tonight to show that to you, all right? So in, um, and actually you're gonna find this article in my free reads category, all right? So there are a number of articles that I, that I have made available for free in the Treat Lyme book. And this is one of those free articles. There's actually five. There's one on cytokines, which are inflammation chemicals made in Lyme. There's the whole treatment protocol that I've written called the successful treatment recipe, which you gotta look at. That gives you the foundation of how you do any, any Lyme disease treatment. But the one I'm looking for is this one called Kills Lyme Germs, a brief antibiotic guide. And I would take a look at this with more detail later, okay? But in here, I talk about the principles of how you build a Lyme treatment. And one of the things I say to do is to combine antibiotics that treat all forms of the germ. That's what I was just describing to you, okay? The other thing that I do here is I talk about the various kinds of antibiotics, okay? And so I talked, I was just talking about cephalosporins. Here's where I described them. I don't have the one listed that you're using, but it's the same principle, okay? And they treat the spirochete, okay? Here I talk about the tetracyclines. Um, and in here, I also have an article, a brief description of the grapefruit seed extract, okay? And I even give you down here ways that you can build treatments. I give you 10 examples of how you would use herbs or prescriptions or prescriptions and herbs together to treat Lyme. So take a look here. You're going to see various ways that I recommend to do it, okay? But again, I, I recommend that people change their antibiotics about every six months, okay? That's going to give you a better chance of getting rid of your germs because you're going to tend not to develop the antibiotic resistance, all right? All right. Thanks for that question, Suzanne. I hope that gives you some useful information. All right, I'm just getting rid of Suzanne's question here. All right, oops, there we go. We just had a Basinji hop in the background. Um, that, everyone, was Halo, and that now has forced Thor off of the table. <laughs> They're trading with each other. So anyhow, um, those are my Basinjis. I said you might see them tonight. Um, okay, hello, Brenda. Let's see, I so appreciate your help. Uh, you're welcome. Uh, my doctor just recommended amoxicillin and probenicin for seven days, along with Bactrim twice a day on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and Tindamax twice a day on Tuesday, Thursday, and Saturday. After one week, discontinue all for three weeks and repeat dosing every month. What are your thoughts? Um, that's a, this is a complicated uh, puzzling regimen they have here. Hold on, I'm gonna be quiet. I need to just reread through and see how they're doing this regimen here. Let's see. Moxicillin, seven days. So you're only using, if I understand this correctly, you are using antibiotics one week of every four weeks. Yeah, you are. Okay. So um, there's a number of thoughts that I have here. So first of all, let me just talk about the antibiotics that you're using. And then I want to talk about pulse dosing. Um, and to let you know, actually, that probably within the next week or two, I'm going to have a more detailed article out about this phenomenon that many of my colleagues are trying right now called pulse dosing for which I have mixed feelings and you're going to hear about my mixed feelings here in just a minute okay all right so amoxicillin as I said is uh, is actually I didn't say this but amoxicillin is uh, works in a similar fashion to what the cephalosporins do all right and so it works by punching holes in the covering of the spirochete so it treats spirochete line 
Probenicid works by decreasing the ability of your kidneys to pee out, to clean out amoxicillin. So what your doctor is trying to do by having you be on probenicid is they're trying to have you increase the amoxicillin levels. Um, I don't use probenicid anymore. Actually, what I do is I just have people take more amoxicillin. So I sometimes will use amoxicillin um, um, at four times the amount that you would for other conditions like sore throats and ear infections. So four times, okay? So usually for an ear infection, a sore throat, you're gonna take amoxicillin one pill three times a day, a 500 milligram pill three times a day. I like to use it at um, three or four times that amount. And the reason I do that is it can become the equivalent of an intravenous antibiotic. If you put that much in you, it's gonna build up very high levels in your blood and can be as effective as an IV antibiotic, okay? So that's why I use high dosing like that, all right? Um, but anyhow, you'll see that in the, the article that I just showed you about Kells Lyme germs, a brief antibiotic guide. I describe IV equivalent treatments, and that's where you'll find information about that amoxicillin the way I was just describing it. So I don't use probenicillin. I just use higher amounts of amoxicillin, okay? Bactrim, um, I do not find to be a useful antibiotic to treat uh, Lyme, and so I, I, I don't use it as part of my treatments. I will use Bactrim. Um, as part of a treatment to treat the co-infection Bartonella, but I don't like pulsing it in a Bartonella treatment. And the reason is, is Bartonella replicates every 24 hours, all right? So if we start and stop a drug, that Bartonella is gonna grow back quickly. So you can, I don't agree with people that are pulsing in any fashion antibiotics to treat Bartonella. Now, I don't know if that's why your doctor is using Bartonella here, but if he's using it as he thinks it might help with Lyme, I don't find it to be an effective drug for Lyme. But if he's using it because he thinks you have Bartonella, I think this is really just a bad idea because uh, Bartonella replicates every 24 hours. It's gonna come back too quickly, okay? By comparison, the reason that you can pulse on and off antibiotics for Lyme is the Lyme germ, uh, depending on who you look at, whose studies that we look at, the Lyme germ replicates every four weeks to every eight months. This is slow growing stuff, all right? So in the period that you're off of antibiotics, it's not going to come back quickly, okay? So you have time to be off of antibiotics when you treat Lyme, okay? You can pulse when you treat Lyme. All right, Tindamax is gonna be used to treat uh, uh, the cyst form of Lyme and also can treat intracellular Lyme. So your amoxicillin Tindamax is a useful Lyme treatment. Tindamax also, according to some Petri dish experiments uh, that were conducted by um, uh, Eva, Eva Choppy, and that's S-A-P-I is how she spells her last name. She's a PhD running one of the most novel Lyme disease research uh, clinics in the country right now out in New Haven, Connecticut. But about five years ago, she did some Petri dish experiments where she looked to see what antibiotics kill Lyme the best and do they get it biofilms. And she was able to show on her Petri dish experiments that Tindamax will remove 195% uh, actually of biofilms. Biofilms, everyone, are a slime layer that Lyme can grow to cover itself, all right? Okay, so don't pulse to treat Bartonella. So if you have Bartonella, this is a wrong idea, okay? Um, now, in terms of Lyme pulsing, so this is a current in vogue thing, all right? So about a year ago, it became really an in vogue thing. It is the current it treatment of the season. And the reason I say it's an it treatment is this is what we do in the world of Lyme. We all get excited about some idea every year and we try it out and we decide if it's gonna work long-term or not. Um, so I do do some pulse dose regimens, but I think this idea of pulsing a uh, one week of antibiotics and three weeks off is too long of a period off, number one, because it, as I said, Lyme may replicate every four weeks. So you're really, you're off the antibiotics perhaps just a little bit too long. The idea behind pulsing is that as you stress the germ with antibiotics, a lot of those germ forms may convert into cyst forms and may also move into biofilm communities, okay? So in the time that you're off the antibiotic, what we would hope is that the germs will come out of the cyst form and that they will move back out of biofilm communities so you'll have an easier time killing them, all right? That's what the rationale is. But I think this is too short of a period that you're on antibiotics. Um, we really don't know the best way of pulsing antibiotics. Everyone has got their own idea on how to pulse, all right? So 
usually if I'm going to pulse antibiotics, I'm actually going to use them every week. And my regimen that I find to be helpful is to use antibiotics, the same antibiotics. In this case, it'd be your amoxicillin and your tinnitus. I'll usually use them four days in a row and then take three days off each week. That way things can come back out of the biofilm, come back out of the cyst forms, okay? That's how I pulse when I'm using it as part of a regular treatment, all right? Then I also do a different kind of pulse uh, when I'm treating somebody for Lyme that has become resistant to treatment, or I call that more of a persister state of Lyme, okay? So there's starting to be a lot of work now, and again, this, this is another article I'll be writing over the next month. So for many of you that may have gotten my newsletter this week, you saw I predicted that the, the type of articles I'll be writing over the next month, and I already know what they're going to be, okay? Uh, one is going to be on the new, um, a new a Lyme test that has come out as a urine test to look to see if you have, the, uh, you're peeing out parts of Lyme to be used in an acute setting to see if you have Lyme. I'll, I'll review that. I'll tell you whether I think it's a good idea or not, okay? Um, uh, uh, there's another article that I wanna write about with what is called persister Lyme, and I'm gonna call, expand it into calling a persister state, okay? So persister cells are something that we have learned about in the world of tuberculosis, which is law, um, tuberculosis at a point stops responding to antibiotics and it goes into what's known as a persister cell. It just doesn't respond to the antibiotics, okay? There's research showing that if you use treatments that we that, that um, adapted from the world of tuberculosis to treat persister Lyme, that, um, that the research says that if you do a regimen of starting, being on antibiotics, stopping antibiotics, starting and stopping, you can get the germ to come out of persister cells and become more active and they'll respond better to antibiotics. Now, it's hard to tell from those experiments what is the right regimen of being on and off because these are petri dish experiments, okay? Um, and in fact, it's not clear about the duration as those would apply to humans, all right? Now, I take the concept of persister one step further. I think what happens with persister Lyme is that, which stops responding to antibiotics, is that you get persister cells, all right? And also part of the persister uh, phenomenon is that in addition to having persister cells, you also get Lyme moving more into biofilm communities and you get Lyme moving more into cyst communities. And these are the hardest to treat, okay? Persister state stops responding to antibiotics, I theorize, because it stops growing rapidly enough, okay? Antibiotics probably work better on germs that are growing, all right? So a persister cell may be Lyme that is more in a hibernation kind of state, if you will, all right? So what I like to do for this idea of persister Lyme, persister cells, and just this persister state where you get biofilm communities and microscopic um, uh, cyst communities is I like to use an idea that uh, Dr. Berescano came up with a number of years ago, which is to be on antibiotics for about two months continuously and then stop for about two months and then go back on for two months, stop for about two months. And you do that about four cycles and it's very possible. He claims such a regimen, a similar regimen cured his Lyme, okay, he thinks it cured him. I don't quite see those results, but I have used this idea of starting a big, I call it a big wave pulse, okay? So big wave being two months directly on, two months off. That kind of regimen, in that period that you're off the antibiotics, the persister cell goes back into more of a growth state so it can respond to the antibiotics better. And I believe that the germs come out of biofilm communities then and out of their cyst forms they'll respond better to antibiotics too. And I've been able to take a number of people, like one woman that we had treated for a couple of years with Lyme and really didn't get too far. Her energy was hanging out at like one out of 10 to two out of 10. And we've done four rounds of that and her energy now is hanging out at seven to eight out of 10, okay? So that, I call that a big wave pulse. Two months straight of antibiotics, two months off, okay? Now the type of pulsing you're doing, I call small wave pulsing, okay? Which is a few days on, few days off. But again, I have a big problem with how they're doing yours, um, which is Bactrim, if they're using it for Bartonella, bad idea for how they're doing it. 
And secondly, I just think they're using antibiotics too short term. That one week I don't think is going to be enough to get adequate killing. And then to be off for three weeks, I think you're going to start getting into too much growth of your germ coming back. So my thoughts are, I don't like it, <laughs> to put it bluntly. I think you can tell, right? But the bottom line is we have no research that says what's the best way to pulse antibiotics. And what I can tell you is it's the current Vogue thing to do, all right? And I call them the it treatments of the season, and, and pulsing antibiotics has become the it treatment of this season. And uh, who knows? Uh, we'll find out if this is what all the Lyme docs are doing a year from now too, okay? All right, there you go. Thanks for that question, Brenda. Let's see. Hello, Elaine. Let's see. I contracted Lyme one year ago. Most symptoms subsided in six months. Ah, I think you've done this in broken questions. Hold on here a minute. I'm going to try to find the other parts here just a minute. I think I see that you might have written a whole question. Let me go. Let's see. Hello, Dr. Ross. I contracted Lyme one year ago. Most symptoms subsided in eight months. Stress seems to cause brief relapses lasting two or three days. I develop nightmares, have aching calves, and have, uh, vi I think you're saying, vibrational feelings in my body. This always occurs during the night, and the AM symptoms subside, and I can function. And I think there is more to this question. Let me see if I can find the next part here. Well, I don't see a next part. So let so let me um, Elaine. Let me just try to make a comment about what you've said here. Okay. Um, so one of the biggest suppressors of the immune system is stress. All right. Um, stress um, is well shown through uh, work of, uh, of a, a research scientist, Candace Pert, has done a great job showing the effect that the brain has on the nervous system and how the brain will release a group of chemicals, a neuropeptide chemicals that can suppress the immune system when one person is under stress. All right, so that's one comment, okay? So your stress may suppress your immune system, all right? Now, when somebody has Lyme of a year duration or more and we use antibiotics to get them well, even though we may make it so their symptoms get a lot better, there still is a big possibility that they have Lyme living in them, okay? I am one of the group of doctors that believe that when you have Lyme of a year duration or more, and, and uh, we treat it with antibiotics, the best we're doing with our antibiotics is to um, knock the germ load down so that it's not so adversely help hurting your health, okay? So it's not so making you feel sick, all right? So even when you're done with antibiotics, the germ is still in you, and we need to do everything we can to help your immune system keep it under control, all right? So one of those things is deal with your emotional toxins, all right? So this is a toxin issue, all right? So your stress is being toxic to your immune system. And so if there's ways that you can deal with that, there are some great ones, okay? One is if you're a person that stress bothers you, start to exercise, all right? Exercise is one of the best ways if you can do it five days a week, and I know that may sound like a lot, but it is one of those things that actually has the greatest benefit on your immune system, is to exercise, try to get up to 30 minutes, uh, 150 minutes a, a, a week is best, which would mean five 30-minute sessions. Work up to it slowly, especially if you have Lyme disease. Uh, maybe, it, maybe for you, you're only gonna be able to get up to 15 minutes. Um, uh, five times a week, but and that could even be walking, okay? Some kind of movement or walking if you can do it. Now, I say that knowing that in the world of Lyme, we have to be careful about um, exercise, but if you could slowly build up uh, and start exercising, that can help with your immune system, okay? Secondly, you might want to consider learning how to meditate, all right? Trying mind-body exercises, mindfulness, ways of meditating that can help because that there's good studies that show that that decreases stress, decreases our ability to handle stress, so your immune system will start working better. And then the third thing is that helps with stress, helps our body deal with stress, is to make sure you're getting seven to nine hours of sleep a night, all right? So those would be some ideas for you to think about. Those are some great ways to keep your immune system under control. But this sounds like you're getting immune suppression, which is allowing temporarily for your Lyme germs to get active, all right? All right. 
Um, so Elaine, good, good luck with that. I want to show everyone that an article that I have about the steps you should take at the end of treatment to prevent relapse and to support your immune system. Okay. So yeah, go there. All right. So we're back in the treat line book here. All right. And so I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to look on the chapters tab here. Um, I want to find my chapter on uh, end of treatment. So there it is. Okay. So there is a, there's two articles that you may want to take a look at here. They essentially cover the same things. There's this one called Finished, How to Prevent Relapse. Okay. So it talks about the steps to determine if you're done with treatment, for which I want you to know there is not a done test in Lyme. Okay. It's based upon symptoms. All right. So you can, you'll see that when I, in this article, I talk about the steps to take to prevent relapse. Um, yeah, it actually is all part of the same article. I used to have a separate one on relapse prevention, but I rolled it into this article, okay? So take a look here. I talk about all the things you do to keep your immune system working well to prevent relapse, okay? Um, and then there also, again, about relapse, there's an art, or to, about being done, I, I, there's an article here you may want to take a look at. Is there a Lyme done test? No, okay? And you can take a look at that and see why I say there's not a done test, okay? All right. So let me go back here again. All right. So, um, I, Elaine, I hope that gives you some help with your question there, okay? All right. Let's see here. Hello, Leslie. Let's see. I have interstitial cystitis. Everyone, I see is interstitial cystitis. All right. I have interstitial cystitis symptoms diagnosed as being caused by Lyme. Antibiotics make the symptoms worse. Is this always a Herx reaction or could the antibiotics cause bladder irritation? That's a good question. Um, let me talk about a couple of things here first, then I'm going to try to answer that question for you. All right. So everyone, interstitial cystitis is a condition where you get inflammation of the lining of the bladder. And it gives you symptoms that feel like a bladder infection. So people will have an urge to pee frequently. They might have burning when they urinate. Um, they uh, may have a lot of cramping in the bladder area, okay? So those are symptoms of interstitial cystitis. So they feel like a bladder infection. And when we go ahead and try to confirm if you have a bladder infection by having you pee for us and then sending the urine to the lab to see if they can grow bacteria in your urine, we'll find that nothing comes back, all right? Now, that actually can occur in two situations, actually, and it's more predominant if you have Bartonella. It occasionally happens in Lyme. So when I have somebody with interstitial cystitis, I'm already thinking, hmm, I wonder if they have a Bartonella co-infection, and I'm going to then look to see, do they have other symptoms that suggest Bartonella as well, too, all right? So you can read more about what those symptoms are. There's a, in the How to Diagnose chapter, there is an article on Bartonella symptoms, all right? But I'll tell you what they are. So symptoms that make you think of Bartonella are having uh, pain on the soles of the feet, by the balls of the feet, actually, um, ongoing anxiety, sometimes depression, but just this kind of ongoing, not just I'm worried about my health, but it feels like it's organic being generated within you anxiety. Uh, severe cognitive problems can sometimes make us think of, of Bartonella. Um, having neurologic conditions, a strong neurologic um, presentation, the way that your Lyme is behaving, okay? So people with seizures, people with tremors, um, uh, people with uh, loss of feeling or people with nerve pain. Nerve pain would be like sharp stabbing, shooting, piercing, burning, or electrical pains, all right? Uh, having loss of abdominal pain, having lots of lymph nodes that are swollen. Um, these are things that make us think of Bartonella. Also, Bartonella can give increased daytime sweating, and Bartonella can give restless legs. I feel like you got something crawling on your legs all the time, um, and that if um, and so you feel like you constantly have to move them. That's called a restless leg syndrome, okay? That can be associated with Bartonella too. So my first thing I would urge you to do is make sure you're treating the right thing, okay? So yes, Lyme may be part of this, but I would wonder if there is a, a Bartonella um, infection as part of this too, okay? Secondly, there are some great things you can do to heal your uh, bladder so that even if your antibiotics are causing more of an irritation problem for your bladder, eventually you should be able to get on those, all right? So there's uh, three different supplements you could take for this 
two of them are actually in the third, okay? So the two major things that can help the bladder, one is an herb called quercetin. Quercetin is found in the, the lining of, of colorful uh, fruits and vegetables. It's a bioflavonoid. It helps in allergies, but it also helps control cytokines and inflammation, okay? Um, so quercetin is one. If you t use it as a separate herb, uh, we have it as a product that's a 250 milligram product, but you want to take 500 milligrams three times a day. And then you'd combine that with another supplement called glucosamine sulfate. It's a 500 milligram pill, and you would take that as one pill three times a day. Okay, now many of you may know about glucosamine sulfate. We use it for people that have uh, osteoarthritis, which is arthritis where the cartilage wears down in your big joints, like your knees and uh, sometimes your back joints and your neck joints, okay? So glucosamine sulfate is a building block for cartilage, so we often use it for that reason, okay? But in interstitial cystitis, what we use it for is in the bladder, it's broken down and it, it, it creates a microscopic gelatinous coat that covers the lining of the bladder so that your urine doesn't irrit keep that irritation going, doesn't keep that inflammation going in the bladder lining, okay? So you use quercetin to get the inflammation down and then you protect the lining of the bladder with uh, the glucosamine sulfate, all right? So you can do those as two separate herbs or there is a company called Vitanica that makes some, a product called Bladder Ease that has both quercetin and glucosamine sulfate in it. In addition, it has some um, L-arginine in it as well too that um, can help with this situation as well too. If you do the bladder ease, you would do four pills three times a day, all right? So I wanna just do a quick screen share here. I wanna show you um, those two products that I'm talking about, or those three products I'm talking about. All right, let me go back here. Okay, so I'm gonna go over, this is the supplement store where my patients get their supplements. Um, this is the Marty Ross MD, Terabrook ND supplements. Um, if you're looking for high quality supplements, I know I, I talk in the treat line book generically. I don't give you brand names. The reason I don't give you brand names is that um, I'm not allowed to by uh, requirements of the Federal Trade Commission and also the Food and Drug Administration, okay? So I talk about generics, but if you want to know actual product names, the ones that we think give you the best chance of the generic names we talk about, you can find them here at Marty Ross MD, Terrebrook MD Supplements, okay? So the first thing what I'm going to do is I'm actually going to search. There's two ways. You can actually go up here, search for the name of the supplement you want, all right? So you could write quercetin here and see what we cover, all right? Or the other thing I'm going to do just to be sure is I'm going to go ahead to this tab that says supplements. I'm going to go to the one that says by medical problem and I'm gonna to go to bladder, all right? So in here, you're gonna see glucosamine I was just telling you about, quercetin, and then here's the bladder ease product, okay? So uh, take a look here later, you'll, you'll be able to see the different products that we recommend, um, the ones that I was just talking about in particular, all right? The other thing, there is a, in the Treat Line book, there is a chapter on the bladder, uh, let me see if I can find that here. Whoa, it looks like I may have not gotten it on this list. Oh, there it is. Okay, so here's the article on, this is called Plumbing Repair, Natural Medicines for the Bladder. This is everything that I was just telling you about, okay? So take a look at that article later if you wanna come back and relook at it, okay? All right, let me go back here. Okay, Leslie, uh, now back to the last part of your question. Let's see. Um, let's see, antibiotics make the symptoms worse. So it is, there's a couple possibilities. One is the antibiotics may just be directly irritating your bladder. The second thing is that you could, this could be triggering a Herx that is making your bladder worse too, okay? So, um, so in, in a Herxheimer reaction, everyone, what happens is the immune system sees the dead bug parts and toxins that get released from the inside of the cell. And the white blood cells in the immune system start making more of an inflammation chemical called cytokines, all right? Now, because you have Lyme in you, they're already making too many cytokines. Your white blood cells make too many cytokines when you have Lyme in you, okay? And too many cytokines give you inflammation throughout the body, but they give you all Lyme symptoms, all right? So all Lyme symptoms are actually excess cytokine symptoms and of which inflammation is part of that. 
So yes, it is possible the inflammation of the lining of your bladder gets worse as part of a Herxheimer reaction, all right? The quercetin actually is one of the supplements that I recommend to block Herxheimer reactions, okay? So if you wanna see what herbs I recommend to block your Herxheimer reactions, because you're gonna to wanna to limit your Herx, all right? In addition to using quercetin, there's some other steps you can take. And so I'm not gonna uh, go into it too much right now, but let me show you the article that you can look at later that gives you the various supplements that I recommend uh, to manage Herxheimer reactions so that you might be able to get more into your treatment, all right? All right, so let me go back here again. Let's see here. All right, so back in the treat line book again. Um, let's look up, there's an article on Herxheimer, so I'm just gonna go ahead and do a search here up above, Herxheimer. So my article on Herxheimer reactions is called Herxheimer Reaction Inflammation Run Amok. Okay, um, take a look here. You're going to see where I talk about Herxheimer reactions. I talk about cytokines, the good and the bad. I talk about how they're made. And then down here, I start talking about what are the steps you take to deal with your Herxheimer reaction, okay? And I give you quite a few herbal recommendations that you can use to manage that, all right? All right, let me go back here. All right, Leslie, good luck to you. Thank you for that question tonight. Let's see, let's get rid of that. Get rid of that. All right, let's see. Okay, here we go. Hello, Val. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Ross. Last time you mentioned that BART and Babesia treatment doesn't cause a Herx. After one teaspoon dose of atovacone was added to his azithromycin, he could not get out of bed for three days. Does this kill Lyme as well or some other Herx producing co-infection? Love your webinars. Thanks. All right. So I guess let me, let me clarify something here. So a true Herxheimer reaction is caused when you kill um, uh, when you kill Lyme, okay? Atovaquone is not killing, well, very interesting question as I'm thinking about. Atovaquone may have the ability to treat cyst Lyme, actually. Um, so that may be where this is coming from. Uh, that's what I would think. I, but again, I don't usually see a true Herx as part of treating Babesia. So this might be that the Atovaquone is actually killing the cyst form of the Lyme germ. There are some people that theorize it can kill cysts. I haven't seen great science on it, but there is the possibility, the way that it works, that it may treat cyst Lyme. So it could be coming from that, okay? Um, yeah, anyhow, good luck to you, and thank you for your comments about the webinars. Um, good luck to your son. Hello, Jill. Let's see. Hi, Dr. Marty, and thank you for all that you do. You're welcome. Let's see. I recently ran out of cemento and was told to substitute cat's claw till the cemento came in. I herxed am still herxing hard. Have you heard of cat's claw being that strong or affecting anyone like this? Thanks, okay. So cemento, just so you know, cemento is also cat's claw. It is, a, um, it is the Nutramedic's brand name for their version of cat's claw, okay? So if somebody had you start cat's claw, it was probably a different product. And it may be that their version of cat's claw is stronger relative to what the Nutramedics product was doing or the dose that you're getting in your Nutramedics product, okay? That's what I would postulate is maybe you've got just a lot stronger amount, all right? Not that you need to, to Herx to get better from Lyme, okay? But you may have gotten a, a relatively, they may have had you take a dose that was stronger compared to the amount of... Uh, of cat's claw that you were getting within the cemento. That's what I postulate might have happened with you. All right? All right. Thanks for that question, Joan. Good luck getting through your Herx. Um, take a look at, again, you're probably still Herxing from it. Um, take a look at the article that I was just showing uh, called Herxheimer Reaction Inflammation Run Amok for some ideas that you can do to help limit that. Okay? All right. Thanks for that question, Joan. Hello, Laurie, let's see. Hi, Dr. Rost. Wondered your thoughts when you have um, multiple autoimmune diagnosis, i.e. autoimmune encephalitis, PANDAS, all five positive for, 
oh, from the molecular labs, genetic HLA and MTHFR positive, Lyme plus co-infections, not get better from IV antibiotics plus low-dose naltrexone now. Your thoughts? Wow. Lori, there's a lot here, and um, I'm just going to start by saying, I'll try to make some response, but when somebody's not getting better, there are a variety of things that can lead to them not getting better, okay, of which you're kind of alluding to some of them here, and, I, and I'll go through your question, but there's many things, all right, and um, one thing you might want to, I'll show you some resources that you can look at for other ideas to consider why you might not be getting better. In addition, if you would like some help kind of teasing that out, consider doing one of my one-to-one -one medical consults, okay? So actually, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do a screen share now. I am gonna come back and do a partial answer of your question, but let me show you something here. I'm gonna do a screen share. All right, so I'm back in uh, at the site, the treat line book, okay? Um, under, and you're going to see either, you can look under the resources tab here for the one-to-one -one medical consult, okay? Or you can now see I have these big labels over here, okay? You can click on this one that says one-to-one -one medical consult, all right? And this brings you to the page that describes how you can work with me online to get help, okay? And it gives you a big sign-up form here. And there's a description on how these work um, and uh, disclaimers about it, etc. The only thing about signing up for one of these one-to-one -one consults is when you do sign up for them, just be aware that I cannot prescribe for you unless I see you in person. But I give you a written note that you can take to your doctor at the end of the visit, and if you need prescriptions, they can take care of those prescriptions for you, okay? All right. Now, there's another uh, thing that you ought to take a look at, and, I, and this was part of the email I sent out yesterday to everyone. There's a chapter I have called Can't Get Better Do This. All right. And um, in this chapter, I talk about there are additional treatments that you should start looking at if everything else isn't working, okay? So you consider adding various detoxification treatments, biofilm treatments, treatments for chronic virus infections, uh, mitochondria dysfunction treatments, co-infection treatments, autoimmune illness treatments like the low-dose naltrexone that you're on, chronic inflammation treatments like low-dose um, uh, immunotherapy, also known as LDI, and yeast treatments, okay? So in here, down here, you can start reading through all these other ideas that you might want to consider doing, all right? I talk about the various things that you might want to consider doing. Okay, now let me go back here. Okay, so when a person is not getting better, it may be that they do have, Lyme could have triggered an autoimmune condition, okay? That's one possibility. And if you happen to be one of those people, low-dose naltrexone could give you some help with that. That's what the LDN is, all right? It is also possible that you have other, uh, another situation is that your immune system is uh, too inflamed. You've got too much inflammation going on, um, and that is triggered by not having enough of a type of cell called a T regulatory cell, all right? So let me talk about that. So there is a type of white blood cell called T regulators, and they're in charge of controlling a type of inflammation uh, called Th1 inflammation, another type called Th2 inflammation, all right? Th2 inflammation is the type of inflammation that occurs when we're allergic to something, all right? So that's allergy inflammation. Th1 inflammation is inflammation that occurs as part of treating infections, and that Th1 involves all the types of white blood cells and cytokines involved with killing viruses and killing bacteria, all right? Now, it is possible that Th1 gets so revved up that you stay sick because it is just putting out way too much inflammation. And if we can get more T regulators that help govern Th1 inflammation, that we can turn down that Th1 inflammation and that people will start feeling better, all right? So the type of treatment that can do that is something called low-dose immunotherapy or LDI, all right? So I have a whole article on LDI that you might want to take a look at. It's still very much an experimental treatment, but it might be something to consider, okay? 
Another thing I look at when somebody's not getting better is do they have an MTHFR defect, um, which is a detoxification problem. I have a whole article about that you can take a look at later. So yes, I would correct for that. Another thing I like to do, and everyone, before I even start working through a lot of these other things, is to do a one-month to two-month trial of cholesterol. And I like to use cholesterol because it helps remove Lyme and or mold toxins that get trapped in a person if you happen to be one of 25% of people that cannot get those mold toxins out, okay? So I have a whole article in that Can't Get Better chapter that talks about that, okay? Um, other things to consider when you're not getting better is do you have dysfunction of the energy factories in our cells called mitochondria? And if you're not getting better and if you have some of these situations like you're describing, I would take steps to repair mitochondria. And I have a whole article out about that, all right? You also want to look to see, do you have problems with chronic virus infections that are triggering all your inflammation? And there's an article about that, all right? So anyhow, um, the big thing I would start looking at in your situation, I like that you're doing LDN. I would probably do a one month repair of your mitochondria, or I'm sorry, a few months repair of mitochondria, see if that makes a difference. I would do some intensive detox work by working on MTHFR, try a trial of cholesterol to see if you're not able to remove Lyme and normal toxins on your own, okay? Try all those steps first. If that doesn't work, then start looking for chronic virus infections. I would make sure you do some targeted treatments of biofilms too. The other thing that you ought to look at is uh, make sure you don't have too many yeast growing that you may have gotten from having been on antibiotics. Simple questions to consider are, do you crave sugar? Do you feel worse after sugar? Do you have acne? Do you have a lot of gassiness and bloating? If you have enough of those going on, that can mean that you may have too many yeasts growing on, okay? And I address each one of those in that chapter called Can't Get Better, Do This, okay? So take a look there. I think it'll give you some things to think about, all right? Um, and if you need help kind of teasing that out a little bit more, take a look at one of my one-to-one -one medical consults. I'd be glad to help you with that too. Okay, all right. Let me go ahead and... Uh, Go back here. Thank you very much for that question. Good luck. All right. Hello, Charlotte. Let's see here. Charlotte, I just I need to take your glass of water here just a minute. All right, let's see here. Hello, Dr. Ross. My daughter has been very ill for seven years and only got diagnosed in December. We have managed to get her um, I think you're saying antigens. See, we have managed to get her antigens to Lyme down to a normal level from 12 to 1, but there has been almost no clinical improvement. She is on azithromycin and pulse doxycycline. She is unable to tolerate uh, any cyst busters. Could this be why she has not had clinical improvement? She sleeps for about 22 hours a day. Okay, so first of all, I assume by an antigen testing, what you're talking about is the new um, Oh boy, I'm, I'm going to blank on the name of it now. The new, it's called a nanotrap test, okay? So it's a, a new test that came out where you can measure uh, pieces of Lyme, or we call that antigens, in the urine, okay? And so the author, uh, the developers of that, that lab is starting to say that we could use it as a means of following what happens with somebody. So if their antigens are going away, that must mean that they're getting over Lyme. I disagree, okay? We have no studies that really prove that somebody, when they stop peeing out Lyme antigens, that Lyme is gone, all right? And so, although it may be a useful test to figure out if somebody has Lyme, I don't think we actually have any way of testing somebody while they're being treated that shows Lyme is in them or out of them, okay? I wanna be clear about that. So I, I don't waste money and resources retesting for Lyme during treatment because I think it gives us false hope. The only way you know that if Lyme is still in a person is by the symptoms. If they're still symptomatic, Lyme is active and in them. The second thing I want to let you know is if your daughter has had Lyme for a year or more, even when she's being done treated, she will have Lyme in her and she may still 
make and pee out antigens that they can measure periodically. And she may even still have positive Western blot tests because she still has Lyme in her, okay? Because I, again, I believe for most of us, once we have Lyme for an, in us for a year or more, we're not getting rid of it. The best we're doing is put it under control. So I am not a big believer in doing any follow-up testing during treatment to see where we are with the treatment because we don't have reliable tests to do that, all right? So I just want to let you know that, okay? All right, now, in terms of why your daughter may have not had clinical improvement is that she just may not have been treated long enough yet, okay? So again, I, again, don't, you can't follow the antigen test. There is no science that proves that lowering antigens means that the Lyme disease is in a better state. It just may be that it, she's is moved more internal and she's not peeing out the antigens anymore, okay? All right, so an average length, let me give you the odds about how quickly people recover from Lyme, all right? And there's a whole article that I have on this in the Treat Lyme book. It's about the odds in Lyme, okay? But I'll tell you what they are. So first of all, an average length of treatment to get over Lyme, if you've had it in you for a year or more, is two years. That's an average length of treatment, okay? The other thing I want to let you know, and I already said it, there is no test that we can do that says where we are in treatment. It gives people false hope when we do these kinds of tests, and they are not reliable. Uh, they may help us make diagnosis, but they are not reliable about following where we are, okay? Um, in so again, on average, to get over Lyme is two years. There is one unpublished study that was presented at one of the International Lyme and Associated Diseases Society meetings um, probably about hey, maybe five or seven years ago. Um, in this study, people were placed on two antibiotics, two prescription antibiotics. One was Flagyl and the other one was Biaxin. And then we watched to see how quickly, uh, or the authors watched to see how quickly people would get better. And what they found is that by three months, 30% of people started having noticeable improvement. By six months, 60% started having noticeable improvement. And by nine months, 90% of people started having noticeable improvement, okay? So what I want to let you know is it takes time, all right? So by nine months, 90% start having improvement. That means 10% don't. That doesn't mean they're not going to get better. It just means they haven't started seeing improvements yet. And again, what I just said is by three months, only 30% of people are having noticeable improvement. And notice I said noticeable. I didn't say they're feeling great on top of the world. I said noticeable improvement, all right? So second thing I want to know is on average treatment is two years. Second thing is it takes time to turn the corner, all right? With treatment, 90% of people get benefits. That can range up to 100%. So there are 10% of people we treat that we can't help. We don't know why, and we're still looking for the ways to do that, okay? And that's even with all the ways that I approach this illness, there are still 10% of people that we can't help. Even the way that Dr. Horowitz approaches this illness, there's 10% of people he can't help, okay? That's what we find, okay? Um, <clears throat> but improvements can help in 90%, in and those improvements can range up to 100%. And we don't know who's going to get back 100%, but everyone has a decent chance at the beginning to get back to 100%, all right? All right, so <clears throat> in terms of why she's not getting better, one is it just may take more time, all right? Um, in terms of not being able to tolerate the cyst busters, she should retry them again, but I would probably try to use uh, grapefruit seed extract as your cyst buster. It tends to be better tolerated, tends not to give the severity of a Herxheimer reaction, okay? Now, if you mean she can't tolerate any of the cyst busters, if it's flagyl or tinidazole, they're hard to tolerate. They make people feel like crap, okay? That's just as a side effect, they do that, all right? But um, grapefruit seed extract generally is better tolerated. It's 250 milligrams, uh, it's a, um, a 250 milligram pill. You would want to do it twice a day, okay? The other thing is manage her Herxheimer reactions, manage her cytokines, be aggressive about using curcumin, 500 milligrams three times a day. And if that's not effective enough, consider adding glutathione to that. Um, that's the second thing I'd like to have. If, if curcumin is not working well enough to get cytokines knocked down to limit those cytokines to so get through Herxheimer reactions, then the second thing I'd like to do is glutathione. And there's various ways you can take it, but one way is to do a liposomal, a fat-wrapped version of glutathione to increase its absorption. Liposomal glutathione. I like working with a product called Tri-Fortify Orange made by Research Nutritionals. 
five milliliters uh, one time a day. If you were to combine that with your curcumin, you might get a better response and help and get her through treatment as well too, okay? Um, so anyhow, those are my thoughts. It, it, and there is no testing that's reliable in these situations. You've got to go more by the symptoms, okay? All right. Um, good luck to your um, to your daughter. I'm sorry to hear that she's where she is. Um, again, for you too, if you, there's any way that I can help give you better advice or even your physician better advice, consider doing one of those one-to-one -one medical visits with me as well too. All right? All right. Thank you for that question. And good luck. All right. Hello, Randy. Let's see. My IGF-1 level is 196. My endocrinologist said the high level can be due to taking herbs. I take Banderol, Cemento, Pinello, Berber. Is this possible that high IGF-1 level due to taking these herbs? Um, Randy, I don't know. I've never, I um, haven't been presented with this question before and I'm not clear if it does or does not. I have not seen it happen with these herbs before. Um, I would be careful because your endocrinologist is probably, could be one of those MDs that thinks that anything herbal is bad and they'll assign any problem to herbs, okay? So um, I, would, I would just throw that as a comment. There are MDs that are that way, but I'm not aware of it causing the problem that you're describing here, all right? Thank you for that question. Just a minute here, everyone. I'm just getting rid of some. Aha, uh -huh. I'm getting to the parts of the questions where people tell me that my screen sharing is working. That's good. Okay, all right. This one's from Lane. Thoughts on rifing? Um, all right, I'll be glad to talk about rifing. So first of all, um, I cannot recommend rifing uh, because the Food and Drug Administration here in the United States uh, has not recognized this as an acceptable medical device and they actually um, have been known to jail, literally jail, some of uh, my colleagues who have used these in their offices, okay? So the politics on this is that I never am able to recommend it to my patients, all right? Now that I've gotten that out of the way, anyone that's listening in that's from the Food and Drug Administration, Marty Ross is not recommending people do rifing tonight, okay? But what I want to share with you is the experience that I see for people that rife, okay? So I'm going to reflect on what I see. So people come to see me that rife. And what I see is that it helps about 60% of the time, all right? So I think, even though I can't recommend rifing, that rifing is something that helps people about 60% of the time. Now, as I look at the science and rationale for how rifing works, I want to let you know some things about it, okay? So rifing, uh, a rife machine is a, a, a machine that generates electromagnetic frequencies that vibrate with the... to work, all right? So it could work on spirochete lime in theory then because the spirochete has a covering. It might work on the cyst form of the lime germ, although it's not clear whether a cyst truly has a covering or not, but it's going to do nothing for intracellular lime, okay? So one thing I recommend to my patients if they decide that they want to rife is to consider being on antibiotics that treat intracellular lime and maybe cyst lime. And if you want to use an antibiotic that does both, uh, do a tinidazole or do a metronidazole, okay? Those would be, or even a rifampin is a way to do that too, okay? <coughs> so to get over Lyme, it still is ultimately going to be hard to not do a prescription antibiotic if you're going to rife. Now, I know there are people out there, Brian Rosner is one that claims he's cured himself with Lyme. Um, and he even he and his Lyme and Rifing resource book talks about that you may still need to do antibiotics, okay? So I want to let you know that, okay? Now, the Food and Drug Administration, the reason that they would um, are just so adamant against people like me recommending Rifing is that um, they would say there's no human safety studies that have been done or adequate ones, and they're correct. There, there are not adequate human safety studies on this, okay? Uh, but remember, we live in a world of electromagnetic frequencies, all right? So the lights that I'm using tonight, the one right over here that's adding light so you can see me, is generating electromagnetic frequencies. My fluorescent lights up above are generating electromagnetic frequencies. This generates electro, 
connect to my cell phone, generates electromagnetic frequencies. We're bombarded in them every day, okay? And to use them as part of a Lyme treatment when you've got so many other things going haywire, it's probably worth the risk of doing it, okay? All right, those are my thoughts about rifing. I see that they help about 60% of the time, okay? Uh, but again, I can't recommend it. Uh, the Food and Drug Administration would come and lock me up, all right? So anyhow, there you go. Thank you for that question. All right. Hello, Suzanne. Would you recommend Tindamax in the beginning treatment for Lyme in the beginning or end? So, Suzanne, I you could use Tindamax at any point of treatment. Everyone, Tindamax is good for removing biofilm, at least according to the Petri dish experiments of Eva Choppy, okay? Um, and it's probably our strongest cyst buster. It's as strong as metronidazole flagyl is, all right? I like it over flagyl because it tends not to have a lot of the intestinal side effects. Flagyl sometimes can give nausea and diarrhea, abdominal cramping. Tindamax tends not to do that. It's a lot more expensive, though, so the insurance companies like to block coverage for it, all right? They don't like to pay for this medicine because it costs more than flagyl, all right? Um, now, it, it can be a strong medicine, though. You can get some huge herxes. Generally, I won't use it right at the beginning. I'll use grapefruit seed extract instead if I'm doing prescription antibiotics, rather than combining that prescription with uh, Tindamax, I might use grapefruit seed extract to limit the severity of the Herx to begin with, but you could do it. You could do it at the beginning or the end. Um, so yeah, those are some thoughts for you. All right. Thank you for that question, Suzanne. All right. Let's see here. And hello, Suzanne. Again, let's see. I have the swollen lymph nodes for Bartonella. What treats this and does this take four to five months to treat? How long does it take the lymph nodes to go down to normal, right? So again, lymph nodes, if they're if you have a lot of lymph nodes, neck, under the armpits, even down in the groin area, that is a suggestion. We can see that with Bartonella, okay? Lyme can sometimes do it too, but it's more of a suggestion of Bartonella. So um, in terms of Bartonella treatments, Suzanne, it's probably going to be easier if you just take a look at what I recommend, all right? So I have an article called Kills Bartonella, a brief guide. And in there, I, do, I outline uh, three tiers of treatment. Tier one are the ones that work the best. There's a tier two that works the next best and a tier three. I'm, I'm pretty basic, okay, with how I describe these. But, um, and I even, uh, and tier three actually are your herbal options. And the herbs work about 70, 75% of the time. So take a look at that article. And I think it'll give you some good descriptions and things to consider for treating Bartonella. Generally, to get over Bartonella is four to five months, all right? So let me just do a quick screen share. Um, go ahead and show you where that is. All right, so if you go back into the treat line book, okay, so again, the whole site now, the whole website is the treat line book. That's how I redesigned it, okay? Um, if you go ahead and look in the chapter called um, Infection Treatment Plans, and there is one in here called Kills Bartonella, a brief guide. It almost takes dynamite. That's why I have it there, okay? Um, and I would go ahead and click on this and, and, and read through it. You're going to see, again, there's my tier one treatments, okay? Tier two, et cetera, all right? So take a look at that article. I think it's just easier to read through it than, than literally going back through and re-describing things that are already in here, okay? All right, let me go back here again. Oops, let me see here, get out of that. All right, thank you, Suzanne, for that question. All right, hello, Lori. Let's see, what about an herb while rifing for those that choose not to use antibiotics? So it's a good question. I actually, I was thinking about saying something about that, but I forgot to. Um, so, um, all right, so again, rifing may, may definitely is probably not going to hit intracellular Lyme, and it may not hit the cyst form, okay? So what I'll do as an alternative is to use uh, the combination of Banderol and Cemento. Those are two products made by Nutramedics. Cemento is cat's claw. Banderol is an extract from a tree called the Etoba tree. 
Um, there's good petri dish experiments that uh, that Eva Toppy did a number of years ago, um, showing that um, those will uh, effectively wipe out all three forms of Lyme germ under the microscope on a petri dish experiment. And Banderol Cemento also get rid of 100% of biofilms. They're probably our strongest biofilm buster. Okay, so yeah, you could you could do those along with um, rifing. You might even consider using teasel root. I don't think teasel, which is quite strong, is going to work quite as well as a Banderol Cemento though. If you are to use teasel root, you're going to want to do it, and that's T-E-A-S-E-L, teasel. Um, you're going to want to take work up to 30 drops of that twice a day, just like you do the Banderol Cemento at 30 drops twice a day. Okay? All right. Thanks for that question, Lori. All right. Let's see. See, let's see. Basic, everyone, we're basically, I'm out of questions. Lori's been writing them in, so I, I, I'm, I'm going to keep taking hers. We have about another 10 minutes. If people want to still try to write some more questions, feel free to. Lori's already got two here, so I'm taking them. So, But if anyone has anything else, write them. I may be able to still get them in the next 10 minutes remaining in our webinar. And if you don't, I will go home early tonight, and I will be okay doing that too. <laughs> so anyhow. All right. So let's see. Lori says, and what about burning eyes, face symptoms? Do you see this? If so, is this a red flag for one of the co-infections? I do see it, but I don't necessarily ascribe or um, – think it is part of any one co-infection, okay, or even Lyme for that matter. So it's kind of one of those symptoms that can occur, but I, I don't know which of the germs is necessarily triggering it to happen, okay? All right. All right. And then let's see here. This is it from Lori, too. All right, Lori, let's see. I have Crypto Plus and BLT for research nutritionals. Those have some of those ingredients you are mentioning. Thanks. Okay, so Crypto Plus, I wouldn't mess. I don't like um, Crypto Plus. You could use for Babesia, but I wouldn't necessarily think of it as being for Lyme. I think your better bet, if you're looking at something from research nutritionals that would augment your uh, Lyme treatment, it would be the BLT. Is what I would use. Okay. All right. All right. Hello, Lori. Let's see. IVIG thoughts. How would that affect Lyme, et cetera, has been put forward for autoimmune treatment for your, thanks for your insight. Okay. So IVIG, everyone stands for intravenous um, immunoglobulins. All right. So, or antibodies. All right. Um, so there are people that um, have immune suppression in a way that they don't make adequate IgG antibodies. And there's testing that you can do. All right. If you happen to have, for sure, based on lab testing, low IgG levels, then you may get benefit by doing IVIG. I don't think, though, that you should do it if you don't have low IgG levels on testing, okay? <coughs> Except there is one situation where it may give you benefit, and that is if you have a small fiber neuropathy, all right? So small fiber neuropathy is a type of nerve injury that you diagnose on skin biopsy. They have to actually look at the nerves on the microscope and see if you have small fiber neuropathy. IVIG can help in that situation as well too. Now there's risk in doing IVIG. These immunoglobulins that you're gonna be doing IV um, have to be donated and they're put together through multiple people donating. In other words, you're getting the blood of multiple people and that blood, even though it's screened for infections, there are still viruses that may get through. There may still be Lyme that gets through because they don't do a good job of screening for Lyme, all right? So I'm very cautious about using IVIG um, unless there's clear indications to do it, which would be having low IgG levels, in which case it can be helpful, or having nerve injury, this type of nerve injury called small fiber illness, then I think it's worth the risk. I wouldn't do it another type uh, for any other reason though, okay? All right, thank you for that question. All right, so hi, Leslie. Let's see, is Flagyl two days a week with amoxicillin daily and azithromycin enough? It might be. I, I, tend to, I tend to go more four days. Now, I don't know if I'm right or wrong, but at least getting it in weekly for some short period of time, I think, has some merits in terms of treating for the cyst Lyme, okay? So, yes, it is possible. 
But as I said earlier tonight, we just don't know the right regimen. No one's done studies to say what is the ideal way of pulsing. And frankly, no one's done studies to say does pulsing work better than using continuous use antibiotics. We don't have the evidence that says that, okay? All right. It, again, it's one of the it treatments of the season. And I, and I say that fondly. I've been around enough that I've seen enough it treatments. A, a year ago or a year and a half ago, it was using essential oils, okay? Um, and... Uh, the, the, the doTERRA essential oils. So it helped some people, but in the end, most people probably didn't get much help from it. Um, let's see, what was uh, another one? Uh, it treatment of about maybe uh, nine months ago was doing medicinal marijuana. And I believe medicinal marijuana is great, but I don't think, it, and I think it's useful, especially in helping in symptoms. There are some experiments that show it can kill Lyme germs, but we found out over time, it's not the greatest germ killer, okay? So that is no longer the it treatment of the season, okay? So I'm just giving you an idea. There are these new ideas that come in vogue and we all jump down that bandwagon but I think we still have to see the test of time on this idea of pulsing if it really matters. And we have no idea what's the ideal way of doing it, okay? All right. Let's see. All right, hello Randy, let's see. How long do you stay on Banderol and Cemento before stopping? How long do you stop before starting again? If you're talking about pulsing, um, I the only way I've really done banderol cemento pulsing is when I'm trying to treat more for persister state Lyme, okay? And again, as I described to you, I think that's a cell that goes into hibernation, biofilm communities, and microscopic cyst Lyme. You get those three kind of situations, okay? And so I will do it as a two-month on, two-month off regimen, the way that I might do prescription antibiotics and that kind of a, a treatment approach as well, too, all right? That's how I've been doing it. All right, hello Charlene, let's see. A grape free seed extract, you use a pill. I just use 100% extract, I cannot stand it. Just interested in your comment. Thanks for all you do, you are an angel on earth. Uh, thank you Charlene, I appreciate that. So Charlene, um, there you can get it as um, a liquid, a liquid tincture. There's a product called citricidal that is a tincture. But boy, that stuff is potent and strong tasting. It's hard to stomach, all right? You can also get it in a pill form. And I, I carry a pill form variety here in our store that I s showed you earlier. And that's a 250 milligram pill. And you can do it as one pill twice a day. It does not have the bad taste, all right? Um, so that would be some considerations for you. Okay. Thank you for that question. Thank you for your kind comments, too. Hello, Peter. Let's see. Is there a reason to increase the dose of Cemento and Banderol above 30 drops twice a day? You know, I don't find more benefit. Now, I know um, Cowden, I believe, and some of the materials I've seen from him or when I've seen him talk, will talk about maybe even going up to 30 drops three times a day. I, I just haven't gotten increased benefit out of doing that, okay? But you can try it. I just, again, I just don't see added benefit, though. Okay. All right. Thank you for the question. Let's see, Suzanne, hi. Let's see, Dr. Ross, lymph swelling associated with Lyme or Bartonella when all this, will this, uh, when will this subside? Any medication suggestions? Um, you know, the swelling will, subs so on the one hand, I wanna let you know, the fact that you have swollen lymph nodes is actually a good sign. It means your immune system is working. It's doing what it's supposed to. It's revved up and you can get a, a swollen lymph nodes from that, okay? So it's not a bad thing to have happen otherwise, other than it can be uncomfortable. You can hurt when your well, lymph nodes get swollen, all right? So um, when will it subside? Probably as your germs get more under control. Um, one thing that you could do is, is to try to decrease your cytokines to see if that would help. That would be working with some of those ideas I have about how to lower cytokines. And to do that, take a look at the article I have on cytokines, okay? Which is similar to the, the ideas I have on Herxheimer reaction because it's basically all the same, all right? So there's an article I have on cytokines. Um, let me just do a quick screen share so you can see that. And actually, I think it's one of my free articles if I'm right. Let's look here. So yeah, take a look at this article called Control Cytokines, A Guide to Fix Lyme Symptoms and the Immune System, okay? All right, so take a look at that. I think that'll give you some useful information. All 
All right, let me go back here again. So that's one of my free articles, actually. Okay, all right, so thank you for that question, Suzanne. All right, all right, Lori, one more. And actually, this is my last, this is the last question tonight, everyone. This will be the first time I actually uh, went through everyone's question. Actually, no, maybe that happened about a year ago, but um, you know what happens is we're in the summertime. I, I don't have as big of turnouts in these uh, webinars in the summertime, which is good. People should be out playing. Uh, but um, uh, but anyhow, um, uh, I'm glad to see those of you that are here tonight. So anyhow, but it gives me an opportunity to answer more of these questions. So, so Lori, let's see. How do you feel about IV nutritionals like glutathione, vitamins, minerals, vitamin C, etc.? Okay. So I think glutathione is a great way of helping detox and lowering cytokines. I do think a lot of people, though, don't need to have it done intravenously, that you can be just as effective um, by doing oral versions or doing nebulized versions. And if you want to see the ways I recommend to do glutathione, take a look at the article that I have on glutathione. It's called Glutathione, the Great Fixer. You'll find it in the treat line book, okay? In terms of IV nutritionals, when somebody is really depleted badly, they're, they're very fatigued, they're frail from Lyme, uh, one of the things that can happen is the vitamins we take main oral, orally may not get absorbed into the cells. And the reason is our cells, if we get depleted really badly, may not have the ability to transport the nutrients in, okay? So the way that vitamins get to the inside of our cells is they have to be carried across the cell membrane, and the cells operate their own vehicle transport system to do that. But if the cells have too low of energy, they may not even be able to have those vehicle transport systems work correctly. So you take oral nutrients, they get into the blood, but they may not be carried in. Now there's another way that nutrients get inside the cells, and that is if you put a high enough concentration on one side of a cell, um, there is a process called oncotic pressure, which is that um, through um, the, the strength of particles being bound together, they will force their way across the cell membrane, okay? So if you concentrate something so much on one side of a cell membrane and there's small amounts of it on the inside, it will work its way. It will diffuse across the membrane without having to use the transport vehicles, all right? So in somebody that's really depleted, IV therapy that has IV vitamins like Myers cocktails, minerals, vitamin C, that may be a useful way of replenishing their cells so they stop they start working better okay so that could be helpful all right all right thank you for that question let's see i will take one more vinnie because this one deserves a response let's see here um with great results treating lyme with banner on cemento why do antibiotic therapy for lyme all right so so banderol cemento work 85 to 90 percent of the time which means they don't work 10 to 15 percent of the time okay prescription antibiotics any one combination that i put a person on work 85 to 90 percent of the time so they can be as effective okay so Vinny, there's 15 percent of people that it doesn't work for all right secondly eventually using them long enough you're going to your germs will probably learn a degree of resistance to the banderol cemento in which case you're going to probably have to use prescription antibiotics all right so those are some considerations of why you might want to use prescription antibiotics all right, all right. thank you for that question all right so india i'm going to just post your question so that I can show you where you should go look, okay? Um, so there's a lot of recommendations I have.